Good morning and welcome to SGPC Celebrations Online. At San Gabriel Presbyterian Church, our goal is to be a Christ-centered church that loves and serves God as we make a difference in our community. I'm Leslie, and I've been at San Gabriel Press for over 27 years since it began. Today, Pastor Joshua is going to start a new series called Faith That Works. They'll, throughout the week, there will be more content on this topic, and if you're interested in receiving emails regarding this, you could look us up at our um, website at sangabrielpresbyterian.org sgpc online and put in your email and we can send you emails informing you when new content is available you could also look us up at facebook on facebook and on instagram the elders and staff of the church would also love to be in contact with you and support you in prayer at our website at sangabrielpresbyterian.org uh, backslash content dash us at the bottom you could fill out forms with prayer requests and thus uh, the session and the elders and the staff can pray for you just because we are separated and at home doesn't mean we can't interact with each other if you're watching this program together with other people let's take a moment right now to reach out to them hug them and and uh, just sh say hello and share with them if you're in a Facebook or Zoom together, maybe take a moment and go to the chat room and say hi or share an emoji or share a GIF. Take a moment right now and share with each other uh, the first restaurant you would like to go to visit once the social distancing has been lifted, just to share a, a little fact about yourself with the people around you. We're social people and we should not, not share with each other what we love and what we like to do. Uh, we should always try and spend time with each other during these uh, uh, time of separation. So let's take a moment to do that right now. Today we'd like to join in prayer uh, about our local community. And there's a verse that comes to our mind that we want to look at, and that's Jeremiah 29.7. Look it up in your Bible and you see that the Israelites have been sent off uh, away from Israel. And they're in a place they really don't want to be. But God has told them to pray for peaceful and prosperity, even for the people in this area, due to this separation and during this time of turmoil. Let's take a moment to pray. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for these opportunities you've given us, for these changes that are happening around us. We know that in times of changes, there are many new opportunities for us to reach out to others, to reach out to the people around us, to share and to grow. Let there be peace during these times of changes and let there be prosperity for all. Let us take hold of these changes and embrace them and not look at them as punishment or as things that are wrong, but accept them and to work with them and hopefully through them, see how we can glorify you and glorify your name. We thank you and praise you. In your name we pray, amen. One way we can glorify God is to give back to God uh, for the blessings and the things that he has given us and the changes he has made in us. Uh, if you'd like to give back to the church monetarily, you could go to our website at sangabrielpresbyterian.org backslash give and give online. You can also write a check and send it to the address listed below. Also during these times uh, that we cannot meet at church, there are many things that have changed. We used to serve at church, whether it be as an usher or singing on the praise team, teaching Sunday school. All those things have not occurred in the past three, four months. We thought maybe when this separation and this social distancing, distancing started that it may only last for a month or so, but now it's lasted for like four to five months. So during this time, let us also think about how we could give back to God, the different ways that maybe we could serve God now that we are socially distancing and not meeting in person. 
Maybe it's helping someone to go to the supermarket or helping a neighbor get to uh, an essential appointment that they used to take the bus and now are too anxious to take uh, uh, public transportation. There are things that we could do now and use our talents that God has given us that we were doing at church that we're not doing now. Maybe we could uh, contact Josie or Margaret or the, your elder, communication elder, and see what things we can do to help and to serve. Now that we're not meeting at church, there might be other things and see how we can serve God in different ways during this change and uh, all the changes that have happened from COVID-19. So let us pray now for our offering. Dear Lord, we thank you for the many gifts and, and blessings you've given us. Bless these things that we give back to you now. Bless the money that we give, that it might be used to serve you and help the church and community around us grow. Also help us to see new ways that we could serve you. Put your Holy Spirit into our hearts and minds that we could think of things to do to glorify your name and to help others around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Today, Pastor Joshua will be starting his new series on Faith That Works. Let us open our hearts and minds to listen to the word. Pastor Joshua. Good morning. Starting today, we're going to kick off a new series called Faith That Works in Times of Uncertainty. Faith That Works in Times of Uncertainty. And what we're going to do today and next Sunday is I'm going to walk you through some of the passages from the book of Joshua so we may ponder what the Bible really says about faith that works, especially in times of difficulty and uncertainty like today. As you see this Jordan River, the river of impossibility that is overflowing all these banks all around the world and now submerging your life, that is COVID-19. But before we dive into scripture and cross over this pandemic together by faith, here's what I want you to know. Contrary to popular belief, this book of Joshua deals with, deals with much more than history. The history of what God has done centuries ago for the Jews. Instead, the book of Joshua is about the life of the church today. It's about what God desires to do for anyone who trusts him and who is open and is leading their life. The book of Joshua is about the victory of faith and the glory that comes to God when his people trust and obey. Now this theme is found even in the very first chapter of the book where Joshua, the son of Nun, who used to be Moses' assistant, is now given the order. Please say with me, the order. Now what's the order? It was to arise and go over the Jordan, taking all the people of Israel into the Promised Land. Now this order was so much burdensome for Joshua. Because when he heard this order from the Lord, it was the moment right after Moses, the greatest servant of the Lord, has died. After the death of Moses, Joshua instantly knew that he had big shoes to fill. I mean, think of it this way. Every tribe, every family, every person of the Israelites had looked up to Moses. For scripture says, there was no one on the face of the earth like Moses to whom the Lord spoke as a man speaks to his friends face to face. That being said, put yourself in Joshua's shoes for a moment. Imagine the pressure and the weight of burden that Joshua had to deal, deal with. Imagine the uncertainty that he had faced in leading the people of Israel all the way to the Promised Land. 
But it was right at this moment, right in these times of uncertainty, that Joshua heard the word of God. Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. Let's turn the Bible to Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 through through 7. God says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause these people to inherit the land that I swore to to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Now notice that the Lord repeats his order, that is, be strong and courageous. Now, how could Joshua possibly be strong and courageous in times of uncertainty, where he had to replace the greatest leader ever, Moses. The only way was to be careful to do according to the word of God. The only way was to obey the word of God. You see, that's the thing, the only thing that makes you strong and courageous enough to get into the promised land in your daily walks with the Lord in these times of uncertainty. Listen, in the Christian life, there are only two ways. There are only two ways. You're either, you're either an overcomer or you are overcome. You're either a victor or a victim. Depending on whether or not you obey the word of God and trust him with all your heart. Now this truth is vitally important because this truth tells us that, listen carefully, God didn't save us to make statues out of us and put us on exhibition in a museum. Rather, God saved us to make soldiers out of us, to move us forward so we cross over the Jordan by faith to claim our rich inheritance in Jesus Christ. And this is exactly where too many Christians today have the mistaken idea of their salvation. A lot of people think that being delivered from the bondage to sin is all that is involved in the Christian life. But listen carefully. The Bible says salvation is just the beginning. Salvation is just the beginning. Once we are saved by grace through faith in Christ, then we are called to fight the good fight of faith, to strive to advance the kingdom of God here on earth. How? As we cross over the Jordan and move forward to the promised land that is prepared for us on a day-to-day basis and claim, even proclaim, the victory of God in the promised land. And that's what the Bible means by faith that works. Meaning once you're saved in the past through faith in Christ, then here's what happens. You must be being saved. You must be being saved today by faith in Christ. So later you will be saved. Whenever he calls you home or whenever Christ returns and you join Eternity with the king in the kingdom of God. And that's the story of the book of Joshua. It's all about the story of faith that works, where his people trusted him and obey his word and experience the victory and the glory of God in such times of uncertainty. So it's not surprising that moving on to chapter 2, Joshua chapter 2, now we see the story of a woman of faith by the name of Rahab, who was the Canaanite, a Gentile, and also prostitute. Then we also see the story of the faith of those two spies who were sent by Joshua to the land of Jericho. And then moving on, moving on to our passage this morning, Joshua chapter 3. Now the focus extends toward the faith of an entire nation in Israel. So now the entire people of Israel would exercise their faith and experience the victory and the glory of God collectively. Now the key word here is Exercise. Exercise. Now, let's say you know all the skill set of workout. You know how to pump irons and lift weights in the gym. That's great. But your head knowledge would not affect your body until you actually go to the gym and exercise to build your muscles to learn the ropes yourself. Likewise, even though Joshua and the people of Israel knew that, they were to be strong and courageous as they, tr- as they trusted and obeyed God's word. This knowledge of truth 
wouldn't apply to their life until they exercise their real faith in the real God in their real life. So the following question is, how can we act, actually exercise our faith on a day-to-day basis to learn the ropes in a relationship with God in times of uncertainty? And what is involved in having real faith in a real God in a real life? Now with that question in mind, let's dive into scripture for this morning. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and then 14 through 17. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and then 14 through 17. Listen to the word of the Lord. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there, Before they passed over, at the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set up from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Let's jump down to verse 14. So when the people set up from their tents, to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the, bearing the Ark were dipped into the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overf- overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zerothan. And those flowing down toward the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priest, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Let's pray. King Jesus. Glorify yourself right here among us in this congregation and also in all the earth. This morning, would you give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, the living word of God, so we understand the thoughts of God, so we understand what's really involved in having real faith in the real God, in our real life, in these times of uncertainty. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here in Joshua chapter 3, uh, scripture tells us four instructions of the Lord, four instructions of the Lord that must be involved for us to exercise real faith, that is the faith that works. Now please take notes as you follow the word of God today. The first instruction that we should practice to have real faith in the real God, in the real life, in times of uncertainty is this. Wait for God's timing. Wait for God's timing. Now, as I already mentioned at the beginning, back in chapter 2, Joshua sent the two spies to Jericho to spy out the land there. And and by the help of a gentle woman, Rahab, these two spies returned safe and sound with the good report. Now, look at the last verse of the previous chapter, Joshua chapter 2, verse 24. Let's uh, go up to verse 24 in chapter 2. Those two spies reproached to Joshua, saying, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Now imagine, okay? Imagine that you are Joshua. And now you heard the same report from those two spies. And you must be pumped, so excited, that you want to say to the people, Hey, people, let's pack and go and take the promised land right now. But what Joshua does next is quite mind-boggling. Now look at verse 1 again in chapter 3. 
Look at verse 1 in chapter 3. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. Joshua tells the people to pack and leave Shittim and travel a day's journey, about 10 miles, to the Jordan. And then once they arrive at the Jordan, Joshua commands them to wait. Wait. If you read verse 2, they actually waited for how many days? Three days. Now, why did they have to wait? I mean, what's the purpose of the waiting for three days? Now, to gain a better understanding of this situation, first of all, you need to have this picture in your mind. Geographically, from that point where they were standing, they could actually look across the Jordan River, meaning they could see the border of the promised land right there. I mean, can you imagine the excitement and expectation that they had? Over the past 40 years, their ancestors had been wandering in the wilderness without being allowed to enter the promised land due to their disobedience to the word of God. But, but their 40 years of long detour in the wilderness is now about to end. And the new life in the land of abundance is so close, they feel like they could touch it, they could taste it. But here comes the problem. Now, right between the wilderness life now and the abundant life there that they see is now about to come, is there the flooded Jordan River. Now, if you see verse 15, it tells us that it was the season of harvest. In the season of harvest, the Jordan was overflowing all its banks, right? And normally, the Jordan River was only 100 feet wide. But during the flood season, during the harvest time, it could swell to almost a mile wide because the entire river would overflow. So during this time, the Jordan River could have been called the river of impossibility. Due to the impossible barrier that stood right before the people of Israel. So as the people of Israel were waiting there, right next to the overflowing Jordan River, I mean, they must have wondered, what on earth is Joshua planning to do? I mean, they were sitting and waiting and now coming to realize, thinking, there's no way for us to build boats in order to transport more than a million people over the water to the other side. Not only that, now they come to realize there's no way to build a bridge because meanwhile, it'll end up making them exposed to the eyes of the enemies and making their families perfect targets for the enemies. So they said, there's nothing we can do to make it into the promised land and enjoy the blessings of God that we are seeing right now, right over the Jordan River. What should we do? But you know what? That was why God brought them there. So they would realize that this situation is totally a God thing. God does the same thing in our lives today. Today, God brings us into the place where in front of us is the Jordan River, this pandemic. In front of us is an obstacle. In front of us is a barrier that is hindering us from moving forward and experiencing what God has prepared for us. But when you come to realize that this Jordan River is real, I mean, this obstacle is real, this pandemic is real, and there's nothing you can do for real. That's the moment where God will lift up your eyes and let you see the real God who made this river and therefore who is in control of this river. You say, Pastor, how do I encounter the real God in this real situation through the real faith that is faith that works? I mean, where does this real faith come from? Listen carefully. It comes from hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from seeing? No. Scripture says faith comes from hearing. And then hearing through the word of Christ. When you see nothing but the obstacles, when you realize that these obstacles are real, this pandemic is real, and impossible to overcome. That's the moment of blessings. Because that's the moment where your real faith kicks in. 
right before the Jordan that is overflowing and real in your life. God wanted the people of Israel to see not the obstacle, but the one who brought them to the obstacle. So they would experience the living God who gives them a victory out of this impossible situation by making the impossible possible. How? As they hear the word of God while they were waiting. While they were waiting. All they had to do was wait for God's timing. As they hear the word of God and prepare themselves to obey. And this principle of waiting for God's perfect timing was well demonstrated in the New Testament for us. Now, please note how many days they were commanded to wait right in front of the Jordan. It was three days. Three days. Now, three days is a significant number in the Bible because it reminds us of the resurrection of Christ. It reminds us that we Christians are called to live a life of resurrection in this world where there's no hope, there's no certainty as we wait for God's perfect timing day by day. How? As we die with Christ today and every day. Three days tells us that in order to be raised with Christ, we must die with Christ first and wait for God's timing for three days. To have real faith in Christ, we must die with Christ and must be buried with Christ for three days first in order to be raised and born again with Christ and live a new life after three days. By the way, that's the picture of baptism, isn't it? Dying with Christ, buried with Christ for three days and then raised with Christ. So since then, we may die to sin and live to God every single day. And that's the picture of the real Christian life, church. And that was the reason for the waiting for three days. It was all about God's perfect timing. But while they were waiting for God's timing, there was one more thing that they had to wait for. It was to wait for God's presence. Wait for God's presence. And that's the second lesson we must glean from the book of Joshua to have real faith in a real God in the real life. Wait for God's presence. Now let's go ahead and read verses 3 and 4 together. Verses 3 and 4. Watch this. And commanded the people, as soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go. The way you shall go. Let me say this one more time. The way you shall go. For you have not passed this way before. Now, over the past 40 years, while their fathers were wandering in the wilderness, there were visible signs of God's presence for them. Now, what were the signs? They were a pillar of cloud and also a pillar of fire that guided them day and night in the wilderness. The people of Israel were supposed to move when the pillar of cloud moved and then stay when the pillar of cloud stayed. But now there's no more cloud that would lead them uh, during the day and no more pillar of fire that would protect them over the night. Instead, they were now commanded to enter the promised land by following one thing. What's the one thing? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark is the one and only sign that would lead them through the river of impossibility and show them the way, the way to go. And then why, the, why the Ark of the Covenant? Now, the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament represents the throne of God, the throne of God, where His glory and presence rested in the tabernacle. Now, let me cast light on a couple of things concerning the Ark of the Covenant. Now, first of all, in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant contained the law of God, right? It contained uh, two stone tablets, the, the law of God. Therefore, the Ark of the Covenant represents the Word of God. Therefore, in the Old Testament, following the Ark of the Covenant demonstrates their faith in the Word of God meaning only the faith in the Word of God and obedience to the Word of God will point the way into the land, into the victory of God. 
Now, this is why the people of Israel here in Joshua chapter 3 are commanded to look to the Word of God, the Ark of the Covenant, for direction. So they may go into the promised land and win victory only by trusting the Word of God. Now, the second thing we should notice here concerning the Ark of the Covenant is in verse 4, the Ark was to be in front of them, right? It was to be in front of them with a distance of about 2,000 cubits, which is equivalent to 1,000 yards. Now, this instruction to keep a distance from the Ark is significant. Because first of all, it speaks of the need of separateness between people and a holy God. It speaks of reverence for the Lord. Because according to the law of God in the Old Testament, the people were never allowed to touch the ark, right? Meaning they were taught to never treat the things of God lightly. But there's more a, uh, a more practical reason that the ark had to be put out in front of the people at a distance. It's because that way the ark could be seen by everyone. As I mentioned earlier, the ark represents the word of God, and therefore the ark represents, are you ready? Jesus Christ, who is the word of God, who became flesh and dwelt among us, by which we have seen his glory, the glory that is full of grace and truth. Which means, later in the story, are you ready for this? When the ark went into the floods of Jordan, when the ark went into the floods of Jordan, it was actually Jesus Christ who went into the floods with them to do the impossible for them on behalf of them. Now this means even in the Old Testament, the impossibility was to be overcome by the ark of the Lord that is Jesus Christ alone. Why? So all the people would see that Jesus is God. Now hundreds of years later, God revealed himself in the same way. As Jesus went into the Mount of Calvary, where the floods of death had submerged him. As much as Jordan here could submerge the ark, then right there at the cross, Jesus died and he was laid in a tomb. But hallelujah, the tomb could not hold him. Jesus rose from the grave and conquered the grave in three days to let all the people of the world know that Jesus is God. That way, Jesus became the way to lead us into the promised land, into the presence of God, into the very throne of God. He became the way, the truth, and the life who brings us back to God the Father once again. And that is why the people of Israel are now commanded to put the ark out in front so the ark could be seen by everyone clearly, so they may get a clear view of Jesus Christ. But today, many Christians don't want to cross over this river of impassibility with confidence, unfortunately, because they never get a clear view of Jesus Christ, who is always going ahead, who is always leading our life in front of us, because they never put the ark, the word, first and front, Instead, they are so much willing to cross the line for the things of the world, going against the will of God. I don't know about y'all, but a while back in Texas, I saw a lot of young students and millennials playing Pokemon Go over their smartphone. And I still remember, I still remember one day while grabbing a sandwich somewhere near the church, I saw the news on TV where two men here in California fell off a cliff while playing Pokemon Go. In the other state, a man even jumped out of the bridge and died on the spot only to pursue those Pokemon monsters that are not real. And it dawned on me, that's exactly the picture of us, the contemporary Christians, living in this world. I mean, we are bold enough, audacious enough to cross the line to pursue the things of the world that are not real, that are therefore only transient, only temporary. We spend a ton of time, day by day, pursuing things on our smartphone, pursuing success, honor, happiness that will pass away at the end of the day. But we barely spend time, even five minutes, even five minutes a day, pursuing the Word of God, 
day by day. If, I mean, if we are willing to cross the line to follow those monsters that are not real, I'm even changing the direction of our life and risking our life. Then why don't we do the same to pursue Jesus Christ? To cross over with him, who is real and who deserves our uttermost worship. I mean, if faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, as the book of Hebrews says, then why don't we follow Jesus whom we cannot see, but is real? As much as we pursue all those things of the world that we can see, but are not real. Why don't we change the direction of our life, even risking all of our life, only to follow Jesus, only to follow the Word of God? As much as we do the same to the things of the world. Hey, church, let us fix our eyes on the ark, the Word of God, Jesus Christ. Let us wait for the presence of God before we try to see the power of God. The ark is not supposed to be behind us. We should put the word of God, the ark of the covenant, and Jesus Christ first and front. And then only then, the presence of God will lead us all the way, even through the river of impossibility. But the thing is, this does not happen automatically. Instead, this wonderful truth mandates that we discipline ourselves, that we train ourselves, to put the word of God first and front. How? As you're being sanctified by the word. Be sanctified by the word of God. And that's the third lesson we should learn from the book of Joshua, to have real faith in a real God, in a real life. Now in verse 5, Joshua says to the people, consecrate yourselves, in other words, sanctify yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now, please note that this was both an order and a promise. But notice which one comes first. The order comes before the promise. It means the fulfillment of the promise depended on their obedience to the order. I'm not sure how many of you realize this, but in many cases in the Bible, God's promises are conditional rather than unconditional. I mean, many promises of God require that we meet certain conditions not to earn God's blessings, by the way, because God's promises are not something we can earn by works, right? But to make sure our hearts are ready for God's blessings in the meantime. That is why God requires certain conditions we should meet. So in the meantime, our hearts are ready for God's blessings. The best way to make our hearts ready for His blessings is to sanctify ourselves. Now, what does it mean to sanctify ourselves in the Bible? The best illustration is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, where God commanded Moses to sanctify the people and let them wash their clothes before they were to receive the Ten Commandments through Moses. God gave Moses, uh, Moses instructions that everyone was to wash their body and change their clothes. The idea behind this order is this. God wanted to make sure that their hearts were ready for God's blessing and power while they were washing their bodies and cleansing and changing their clothes. That's the imagery of sanctifying yourself in the Bible. Sanctification in the Bible symbolizes a new beginning, a new beginning with the Lord. How? As you put off your old garments, as you put off your sin through the blood of Jesus, to put on the new garments, to live a new life, to live like Christ day by day. And therefore, sanctification in a word means Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. Colossians, the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, gives us the best illustration of this lifelong process of becoming Christ-like. Scripture says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, whose name is Jesus Christ. 
that once you're forgiven of your sin by faith in Christ, that's not the end of the story. That moment of salvation is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Since then, you are now given the order of putting off the old patterns of your life to let them be washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ day by day. Once you obey the order, this order, then here comes the promise. Here comes the wonderful invitation to put on the new self, to put on, to put on a new person, Jesus Christ, to clothe yourself in the new garments, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, so you would be more like Jesus Christ day after day. And that you are, as you're putting on Jesus, who is the perfect image of God, and then you gradually restore the image of God that you have lost. That is the picture of sanctification. And that's the promise that you will, you will experience when you obey the order of being sanctified by the word. Now, if you claim to be a Christian today, this sanctification must be evident in your daily life because being a Christian is a lifestyle. Being a Christian is not a statement, it's a lifestyle. But the problem is, many believers today are seeking to be filled before they are emptied. I mean, they want more power, more blessings of God. They want to be blessed and used by God, but they still lack power, joy, fullness of God because they are still living in sin, entangled in sin, without actual devotion to Christ and His Word to empty themselves and then to be filled with Christ alone. Hey, church, before we seek the promise of God, let us obey the order first before we seek to be filled with the power of God. Let us be emptied first. Let us be sanctified by the word of God to be emptied of our rubbish so we can be filled with Christ alone. As you put off the old self and put on the new self day after day, so now you're finally empowered to get your feet wet. Get your feet wet. Now, that's the takeaway for you to have real faith in a real God in your real life in times of uncertainty. In verse 6, Joshua finally commands the priest to take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. Then the priests don't hesitate a bit to obey. And they set out from their tents to pass over the floods of the Jordan that is now overflowing all these banks. And then what happens next is amazing. Now, let's skip down to verse 15. The Bible says, and as soon as, can you say to me, as soon as those bearing on the ark had come as far as Jordan, meaning as soon as the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water. In other words, as soon as they got their feet wet in their obedience to the word of God. Verse 16, the waters coming down from above stopped at a town named Adam and began piling up, backing up a great distance away. Pa, 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 pa. And then the water flowing down toward the Dasi was completely cut off so that the people could cross over the Jordan into the city Jericho. When they obeyed the word of God and stepped out of the comfort zone, as soon as they stepped into the river of impossibility, getting their feet wet, they could see the power and the fullness of God right there. Church, that's faith that works. That's faith that works. And that's what's involved in having real faith in a real God, in a real life. It takes your wholehearted obedience to the Word of God. It takes your wholehearted commitment to Jesus Christ for you to have real faith that is the faith that works in these times of uncertainty. That is why God makes us wait in this very unique season. So in the meantime, we're being sanctified. So in the meantime, your heart is ready to obey the word of God immediately, wholeheartedly, and fully, in spite of consequence. There was a very famous French tightrope walker an acrobat by the name of Charles Blodin. He got famous in 1859 when he accomplished the very difficult task of walking 
a thousand hundred foot type rope suspended a 160 feet above the waters of Niagara Falls. Blodin went on to walk, walk across the falls several times, and then he even crossed over the falls pushing a wheelbarrow. And then when he reached the other side, he asked the spectators if they believed he could do it again. Of course, everyone cheered. And then Blodin asked if they believed this time he could, he could cross the tightrope with someone in the wheelbarrow. Everyone cheered again and saying, yes, you can do it, Blodin. I want to see that incredible stunt. And then Blodin asked for a volunteer to ride in the wheelbarrow. And you know what, you know what happened? No one stepped forward to cross over with him. Because it was one thing to believe Blodin could do, and it was another to put your life in his hands. Letting him push you across the falls on that high wire. Many times we do the same. We say, Lord, you can do it. I want to see what you can do in my life in this ministry. Just give me the evidence. But listen, faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Faith is obeying in spite of consequence. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but, but obeying in spite of consequence. That's the faith that works. That's the faith that you must exercise today in times of uncertainty. Do you really believe that Jesus died for your sin on the cross and you are now set free from the penalty of sin? That's great. But that's only the beginning. If you're saved in the past, then today God wants you to exercise faith that works as you let him push you across the falls, push you across the Jordan, and let him lead your life. Today God wants you to experience the victory of faith and let him be glorified as you, the church, trust him and obey his word in spite of consequence. Because again, God didn't save you just to make statues out of you and put you on exhibition in a museum. No, God saved you to make soldiers out of you, to make you cross over by faith and proclaim your rich inheritance that is prepared for you in Jesus Christ. So here's how you cross over by faith that works. Number one, wait for God's timing. Wait for God's timing. As you meditate on the power of the gospel, where Jesus has overcome the grave after three days of his waiting and his death and his burial. And number two, wait for God's presence. As you fix your eyes on the ark, the word of God, Jesus Christ, as you put the word first in front, once you put the word first in front, and then number three, be sanctified by the word. As you put off the old self and put on the new self, being washed and renewed in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then finally, you will be empowered to get your feet wet, to follow the ark, Jesus Christ, and cross over the Jordan with him. That's faith that works in times of uncertainty. So why don't we cross over together today and day by day until Jesus our King calls us home or he returns through this real faith that works. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in these times of uncertainty, we praise your name. We praise your name for you have brought us to this river of impossibility, to this pandemic. So right here in front of this pandemic that is overflowing all these banks, we meet the living God who gives us victory out of this impossible situation. So we get a clear view of who you are and how you make the impossible possible. Oh, Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the living water of God, let the joy overflow among your children amid this crisis and uncertainty. Let your children wait for your timing by hearing the word. Let your children wait for your presence. 
in pursuing the word and being sanctified by the word. And then your perfect timing, let your church step out of their comfort zone and get their feet wet. To cross over the Jordan by faith in spite of consequence. Because that's faith that works in these times of uncertainty. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now rest upon everyone who stands before the Jordan, the very obstacles of their life, so they now wholly trust the Lord and obey His word, so they boldly cross over the Jordan by faith that works to claim rich inheritance. Prepare for them in Jesus Christ, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Stay safe. We love you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for taking the time and effort to come out and to listen to this service and to join with us. We hope and pray that God has touched you and that the Holy Spirit has blessed you during this time. We hope to see you again next week as we again continue on our journey at St. Gabriel Presbyterian Church. We hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much. Good night.